All right, welcome back to another episode of Theology Applied. I'm your host, Pastor Joel Weapon with Right Response Ministries. And in this episode, I am very privileged to have for the first time, the Redeemed Zoomer. We're going to be talking about five mainline denominations that are both winnable and also significant, meaning that if they could be won, it would matter. They're worth winning. Now, the redeemed Zoomer and I, we have our differences. We disagree on a few things. And so uh, take the winnability with a grain of salt. Um, this is going to be Richard. That's his name, Richard's opinion. He thinks that these mainline denominations are in fact winnable. I think that, you know, some of them might be, and some of them might not be. But either way, um, it'll be a really fruitful conversation for you, the listener, to even just figure out what you know. What is Episcopalianism? What what is Anglicanism? You know, what what are uh, United Methodists? What do they believe? What do they hold to? So, um, Redeem Zoomer is, I think, really helpful in just giving a um, an overarching. Uh, 30,000 foot view with mainline Protestant denominations and understanding their theological underpinnings. In addition to that, think of it as a bonus. Uh, he'll give us some strategies for maybe taking them back. All right, without further ado, here comes the show. Applying God's word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. In this episode, I'm privileged to welcome to the show for the first time, the redeemed Zoomer. Richard, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Webin, for having me here. It's an honor to be here, honor to talk about God's kingdom and how young men can glorify God, serve God, fight for the kingdom, all that stuff. I know that's something you talk about a lot, something I care about a lot. So yeah, this is going to be great. Amen. Um, so let our listeners know just a little bit about you. Most of our audience is probably, I don't know, probably... I think uh, the bulk of our audience is like 35 to 50 years old, but we have younger guys who follow. So I'm sure s some people are, are perfectly aware of who you are. And then there are other people who are probably not. So what, what is the redeemed Zoomer? What do you do? Right. So my story is I come from a very secular leftist background because I went to public school in New York my entire life. I'm a, I'm a Yankee, still not ashamed of being a Yankee, but that meant I had a very, very secular background and I was very opposed to religion until I had a conversion experience at a Christian themed music camp in the Midwest. I went from New York to the Midwest. I saw how much more alive people seemed when they believed in God, when they believed in Jesus Christ. So um, as a teenager, I had a dramatic conversion experience. When I went back home, all my Jewish and atheist friends were really suspicious that I'd become Christian. And um, once I started to question the religion of leftism, because it is a religion, I was basically excommunicated or canceled, so to speak. And I basically, it ruined my social life in high school, but that's when that motivated me to start studying the things of God, start studying the faith. And I was motivated to share the faith with others because I saw how absolutely terrible my generation is. Hmm. Great. Uh, you said Jewish friends and atheist friends. Were you trying mm -hmm. to be redundant or are those two different groups? Not really, actually. <laughs> in, in, like, yeah, I have a ethnically Jewish background myself. My dad was raised reform Jewish. Most of the Jews in New York are reform Jews. Uh, my dad converted to Christianity and now he's an elder at the Presbyterian church. But in reform Judaism, it's just an uh, ethnic social club. You do not have to believe in God. Right. You could believe in no God. You could believe in the pagan mother goddess. The only thing you cannot believe in is Jesus. Right, exactly. In, uh, you can be a Buddhist, uh, you know, Buddhist yeah. Jew, atheist Jew. Jew you just can't be yeah, a Christian Jew. Jew. Are a thing. But no, you cannot be a Christian. That's the, that's the one thing that's off limits in, in those communities. Yep. So I hear. All right. Well, what we want to do with this episode is uh, from what I've seen in the Twitter streets, it seems as though uh, you've got a pretty good sense of the pulse of mainline Protestant denominations. Uh, most mm -hmm. of our listeners are going to be evangelicals. Um, you know, so most of them are going to be theologically and culturally conservative um, and have little to no experience with mainline denominations. And I would be one of those individuals. So I was raised in a charismatic background. I uh, think, you know, Assemblies of God would probably describe a lot of it. Maybe uh, Assemblies of God light. Um, if you think of like uh, John Piper, Wayne Grudem, a third wave continuationism that moves from, you know, the 1950s healing revivals and Azusa Street and those kinds of things to um, still, you know, exercising or attempting to exercise the sign gifts, but, uh, but not necessarily believing that, 
um, that the baptism of the Spirit is a subsequent experience to conversion with the evidence, you know, having to be speaking in tongues. Instead, you know, you're baptized by the Spirit at the point of conversion, and you may have, you know, a variety of different spiritual gifts, and one of them may be tongues, and maybe it's not. So that that's kind of my background. The point is... Mm-hmm. Um, when I think of mainline Protestant denominations, I think of dark, shadowy places where we should never go. So set me straight. Yeah, so the mainline does have a lot of that. In the mainline, you will see some of the worst things imaginable. I have seen some absolutely insane things that made me want to give up and go Catholic, pretty much. I didn't, <laughs> but it was just such a shock when I did see those things. Um The mainline, all these mainline denominations, whether the PCUSA, the United Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, all of them are big tent denominations, big tent, where you'll have um, conservatives, moderates, liberals, and atheist communists all in one big denomination. Um, So the media will only, both Christian and secular media, by the way, will only give attention to the absolute most crazy radical wings of these denominations. So if a, if a pastor wears a Planned Parenthood robe and said, you know, God loves abortion or whatever, the media is going to focus that uh, on that. If a pastor simply preaches the word of God and administers the sacraments faithfully, the media doesn't care about that. Like, you know, the God's flock being fed, who cares about that? A huge political statement by a pastor. Now that's something we should focus on. Uh, so the only time the mainline Protestant churches get any media attention, it's when there's some crazy liberal thing going on but both of those exist within mainline denominations so the church i was um part of when i first became a christian was one of the more moderate pcusa churches um some of not as conservative as some not as liberal as some it was just moderate it was just your average you know normal boomer sort of lukewarm but still pretty all right mainline church but then when i was getting confirmed in the church i went to a confirmation retreat hosted by the local presbytery rather than my congregation And I didn't know this, but I happened to be in like the most liberal Presbyterian in the country. And there I found a pastor who didn't believe Jesus was God, another pastor who called unborn children parasites, another one who called Tim Keller a fundamentalist. (laughs) So um, I was like, dang. And that's when I was like, you know, maybe the Catholics were right about Protestantism being bad. So I went back to my mentor, my mentor who was a solid reformed you know, person in my church, I said, yo, what is up with our terrible denomination? And he was like, you have to realize the reason it got this bad is because of generations and generations of conservatives being passive, not speaking up and running away when things got bad. Mm -hmm. So he told me I should stay in the denomination, stay and fight for it. But for the longest time, I, I didn't know how I could do that because liberalism seemed like such a powerful force. Um, But then I started to study, you know, cultural Marxism and critical theory, and I realized it's not just the church that liberals have done this to, or I guess you should say leftists. Um, Leftists hijack absolutely everything. Uh, Leftists never create their own institutions. All they do is hijack institutions that Christians create. They're, They're like viruses. Viruses can't reproduce on their own. They have to hijack a healthy cell and turn that cell into a virus factory. Likewise, leftists never make any successful institutions. Like... Uh, the leftist factories, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they started as Christian institutions and they were hijacked by leftists. Right. Likewise, leftists hijack churches like the Presbyterian Church and the Episcopal Church and turn those into leftist factories as well. So I realized if we're ever going to stop the long march through the institutions that was planned by the cultural Marxists, uh, we need to take back the institutions that they have taken from us. And that sort of motivated me to stay and fight for my deeply historically rooted denomination rather than just running away from the fight. All right. Um, in terms of, you know, that the analogy that you're using of virus host, those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think of cancer, I think of, you know, chemo, um, Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's, it's difficult because I think there are multiple strategies. There's a strategy of, uh, stay and fight. There's also the strategy of, uh, allowing the host to be so weakened that it actually kills the parasite. There's nothing for it to feed on. Um, mm-hmm. But then, you know, there may not be much life to return to. Uh, there's, you know, so there are pros and cons on both sides. Well, g- give us, let's let's do this. Could you provide for the listener a list of um, maybe five different mainline denominations that, uh, and this would be the criteria, something um, that you think is uh, significant 
It's worth winning. It's worth the fight. Uh, there's actually resources, and I'd love to hear what maybe some of those are, like what what makes it significant, what makes it worth it, uh, staying and fighting and trying to win. And then on the flip side, not just significance, but also um, feasibility. Uh, so main five mainline denominations that are both winnable, um, they're feasible, they actually could be won, uh, but also they're significant. Uh, if they were won, it would matter. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So something all these mainline denominations have that their evangelical counterparts don't is something that is honestly necessary for Protestantism to survive, and that's institutional rootedness. In the Reformation, the thing that distinguished the magisterial reformers from the radical reformers is institutionalism. The magisterial reformers stayed in the institutions, stayed in the same churches and universities that used to be part of the Catholic Church, and reformed them. Martin Luther was preaching in the same church before and after the Reformation. You know, Oxford was the same university before and after it was, um, before and after the Reformation, it went from Catholic to part of the Church of England. So the magisterial reformers, they saw their identity, the identity of the Protestant faith was a reformation of existing institutions. Until recently, until modern evangelicalism, Protestantism has never not been institutional. Protestantism has never not been traditionally rooted. Um, And I think this is kind of why we're seeing a flood of young people convert to Catholicism and Orthodoxy, because they're understanding the importance of tradition and institutions. Um, And it's really hard these days in Protestantism to find an institutional Protestant church that still holds to traditional Protestant doctrines. So all across the board, something all the mainline churches have that is worth fighting for is this institutional rootedness, this historic rootedness. So the Episcopal Church, let's start with that. Um, So many of the founders of America were Episcopalian. Uh, The Episcopal Church is integral to the very identity of the United States. I often like to say that you cannot revive a culture without reviving the church that it was founded upon. You can say that the United States is a pan-Protestant nation, um, but the United States culture was founded upon the Protestant churches, the descendants of which are now the mainline Protestant churches, the mainstream Protestant churches. Just the way I don't think you can revive England without reviving the Church of England. I don't think you can revive Sweden without reviving the Church of Sweden. And the leftists have been very intentional in hijacking these churches because they know how important those churches are for the culture. Um, you can't revive you know, Italy without, without reviving the, the Catholic Church. Um, the, you cannot separate religion and culture. Mm-hmm. So the Episcopal Church especially is very important for the foundation of America. There's so much American heritage in the Episcopal Church. If, if you go to like uh, Trinity Episcopal Church on Wall Street, absolutely beautiful church. Um, it was George Washington's church. And of course, they have pride flags everywhere because the left was very intentional to hijack everything that matters to American Christian culture. Uh, co- the A Christian culture is... Enemy number one of the left, that's why they want to hijack it. So now the Episcopal Church is deeply hijacked, but there is a path for retaking it because there still are conservative bishops. The Reconquista movement I'm part of is actively partnering with some of the conservative bishops in the Episcopal Church. And we have a map of Episcopal churches that are either explicitly allied with the cause or at least share some of the values of the cause of being fortresses of traditional Anglican Christianity within the Episcopal Church, within the broader, uh, broadly liberal Episcopal denomination, as, and staying to fight for it. Real quick, as yeah, so uh, as we're going through this list, could you also, for the listener, um, just take a moment and define each of these denominations? So when you say Episcopal, um, mm-hmm. what's what's the easiest way to explain Episcopalianism? Yeah, it's another word for Anglican. Episcopal refers to the the government structure. Anglican refers to the theology. So Episcopal is the most high church of all the Protestant denominations. It's the most Catholic out of all of them. Sometimes Anglican theology is described as a via media or a middle way between Catholic and Protestant. So especially a lot of people who are craving like, you know, a traditional, you know, Anglo-Saxon form of Christianity, 
Episcopalianism is the way to go. There are a few conservative Anglican offshoot denominations, but they just don't have the tradition because they split from the 300-year-old denomination that contains all the American heritage. So, I don't know, the ACNA, for example, yeah, it's, it's, it's got great theology, but I'm sure all of them would really like to see a revival of these traditional Anglican institutions like the, the Episcopal Church. So that's what Episcopalianism is. There are conservative bishops that are on our side. They're a minority. However, liberal churches always die out. The mainline denominations are all bleeding membership rapidly. The only churches in the mainline that are not dying out are the conservative ones. So this strategy is basically just weathering the storm, fortifying those conservative churches and just waiting for the liberal ones to die off, which they will. Everyone in the Episcopal Church, liberal and conservative, knows that the conservative parishes are the ones that are going to survive the next generation and the liberal ones will not. Would you like to get control of your money and set up a system that will guarantee for the rest of your life tax-protected compounding interest and growth? How about having 24-7 electronic access to your money for funding wisely chosen investments, home improvements, and other large expenditures without going to the mainstream banks? This is not a dream, but it could actually be a reality when working with our sponsor, Private Family Banking. See their contact information in the show notes below. To make this season even brighter, Private Family Banking is giving away a pair of tickets, a $500 value for the upcoming Blueprints for Christendom 2.0 conference, which is taking place on March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 2024 in Taylor, Texas. To enter the ticket giveaway, join their email list by sending an email to banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Again, that's banking at privatefamilybanking.com banking.com with the subject line of your email saying tickets, then include your full name and mailing address in the body of the email. The ticket giveaway entry period will end at midnight central time on February 13th, 2024, and the winner will be notified via email on February 14th. You must be 18 years of age or older to enter, and only one email per person can be entered into this giveaway drawing. Did you know that fresh American black elderberries are naturally high in vitamin C, vitamin B6, phosphorus, and vitamin A, as well as many anthropologists? of cyanins that serve as antioxidants? Regular supplementation with elderberry extracts has been shown to decrease chance of influenza and lessen cold duration and symptoms. The King's Ridge Fresh Frozen Elderberries are hand-picked, de-stemmed, washed, and quickly frozen at their family farm in East Central Indiana. The King's Ridge is a quality-oriented family farm focused on building Christendom. Our friends Trevor and Autumn truly hope that their elderberry syrup and fresh frozen elderberries bless your family this cold and flu season. Don't buy dried European elderberries and support the global economic agenda. Instead, visit tkrfarm.com and purchase your elderberry needs from the King's Ridge elderberries. Again, that's tkrfarm.com. So next week, um, we have the United Methodist Church. Now, this is something I get a bit angry about because the United Methodist Church could have been retaken by the conservatives because in 2019, they had a gay marriage vote yep. um, and the conservatives won. Because However, of, correct me if I'm wrong, but that because of non-Western nations, because it's an international global denomination. Yes, but there still are a lot of conservative United Methodist churches in the United States. It was the international ones that just pushed the vote over the edge. Right. Um, so when the conservatives had a victory, the progressives' mindset was, we're not giving up. We're going to stay and fight. We're going to retake it. And the progressives made plans to retaliate. They tried to like rig the voting systems. And then in response to that, the conservatives, fearing a future progressive victory, all split off, ran away to form the Global Methodist Church, in the process losing tons of their property, having to pay the liberals tons of money to leave. And it was a total disaster. It's The conservative mindset was, uh, we might lose, we have to run away. And the progressive mindset was, even though we did lose, we're going to stay and fight. So it was the progressives that were a lot more bold and courageous. And that's kind of why they won. So the conservatives totally could have won over the United Methodist Church. There are some people who, who try to say, oh, we conservatives, we, we had no choice. We had to run. But I've, I've heard a lot of other United Methodist pastors who are like, no, it was just pure, you know, cowardliness on the part of the conservatives. They totally could have won. They just 
didn't want to be associated with a denomination that had any liberalism, liberalism in it at all. Um, I, you'll hear conflicting stories. It was one big mess. But the point is, even after all that, even after a lot of conservatives jump ship, there still are a lot of conservatives in the United Methodist Church. Um, and it's the same deal as with the uh, Episcopal Church. The conservative churches are a lot healthier. And the conservative churches can last the next generation and the progressive ones can't if we just fortify them. So why is the United Methodist Church very important? The United Methodist Church contains the heritage of the First Great Awakening. Right. If um, the First Great Awakening is kind of why the United Methodist Church is, sorry, why the United States is such a religious place. And much of the heritage of that awakening is preserved in the Methodist Church. Methodism does not come from the Reformation. Methodism comes from the First Great Awakening. Um, so some people might say they're not classical Protestants the way, you know, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians are. Uh, but so much of American faith is tied in with the First Great Awakening. So some people have said the United Methodist Church is a uniquely, you know, American thing. Real, real quick, uh, if we can pause on the uh, United Methodist, uh, just for the listeners. So when um, you correct me if I'm wrong, when I think Methodist, I think Wesley's. So I'm thinking John and Charles Wesley. I'm thinking Arminianism. Um, I'm, I am thinking First Great Awakening. I'm not thinking, you know, Charles Finney or, you know, Second Great Awakening. Uh, but First Great yeah. Awakening, uh, the Arminian kind of counterpart to George Whitfield and some of the Reformed guys, um, you know, Edwards. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also thinking... Um, I think Nazarene being an offshoot uh, coming out of the Wesleyan tradition. And I know for the Nazarenes, and I think uh, it's the same for United Methodists, that uh, that these are some of the longest standing uh, Protestant denominations that have been egalitarian in terms of, um, in terms of uh, ordaining uh, female pastors. I know that for Nazarenes, I think, I, I could be wrong, but I think it's well over 50 years, close to a hundred years that they've been ordaining uh, women pastors. With United Methodists, um, is that, you know, when you say there's, you know, the li liberal ones, but then there's the conservative ones, just so that the listener and I personally understand um, how, how relative we're using the term conservative there. Uh, when you say conservative United Methodists, you're talking about lady pastors, correct? It depends. In all the denominations, I don't think any of them are more egalitarian than others. The egalitarian complementarian split cuts basically evenly through all the Protestant traditions. The only ones that don't have any egalitarianism are Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Um, the egalitarian movement of like, you know, the 20th century, it affected every Protestant tradition equally. So I wouldn't say there's anything uniquely egalitarian about Methodism. You're right that it is generally Arminian. There are Calvinistic Methodists like Whitfield, like you said. Generally, Methodism is Arminian, and it leans in a sort of Pentecostal direction. Of course, that's an anachronism because Pentecostalism emerged much later out of the Methodist tradition. I think Methodism provides a good place for people who want to be open to the gifts of the Spirit, people who want to be continuationist, but want something a bit more traditional and regulated than Pentecostalism. Right. Okay. And for some reason, the Methodists get a unique reputation for being liberal out of all of them. I don't think that's actually true because the Methodist church still has not officially legalized gay marriage, whereas a lot of the other ones, including the Presbyterian and Episcopal church have. So yes, there's liberalism in the United Methodist church. There's liberalism in all these mainline denominations. So I don't think, I don't understand why they get singled out as the liberal ones. Um, the most liberal mainline denomination is the United Church of Christ, which I'm not going to include in this list of, of five denominations that because they are very far gone. It's going to be almost impossible to retake them anytime soon. I'm still leaving it open for a, a much, much later. But um, okay. so that's the United Methodist Church, Arminian Wesleyan theology. Methodist theology is basically Calvinism minus predestination because Arminius was a Calvinist. He agreed right. with Calvinism on everything except predestination. Oh yeah, I, I still use on, on a somewhat regular basis, um, Jacobus, his definition of total depravity. People always think it's John Calvin, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean the whole the whole thing that, you know, the, the reason why he was able to squeak in underneath the banner of orthodoxy is because 
it, he wasn't a Pelagian. Um, it, you know, it, it wasn't oh. this idea that, you know, man is innately neutral or good and that he's reaching up to God. It was, no, man's totally depraved. The, the linchpin is just, you know, the doctrine of prevenient grace. So it's this idea that man is totally depraved, just like you would have within the reform scheme of soteriology. But the idea was that, um, that God, you know, in the preaching of the gospel, that, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, would, would, basically temporarily and partially, to, you know, so for a moment and not all the way, but partially and temporarily bring someone from a state of spiritual blindness, deafness, deadness, uh, to a place of somewhat of a, a moral neutrality to where they could, you know, choose to receive the gospel and move forward and, and you know, and then, you know, in, with that faith be granted regeneration and a new heart and be born again, or they could, you know, miss the window of grace. And that's what, you know, you have like the, you know, uh, the anxious bench, you know, as, as it, you know, developed further yeah. into the second great, great awakening, those kinds of things. But my point is just to say that, you know, when, when you talk uh, to the typical Arminian today, um, it's, it's not actually, it's, it's not Wesleyan. It's, it's nothing that John no. Wesley would recognize, uh, people today, when they talk about, uh, an Arminian, you know, they, they think it's Arminian, but an Arminian idea of salvation, they're saying that people really can just choose God. Whereas, uh, you know, Jacobus would have said, no, of course they can't. Um, it's got to be this prevenient grace that brings them to this, you know, temporary suspended state of, you know, where the spiritual blindness is dissipated, at least to um, an extent to where they can choose Christ upon the hearing of the gospel and move to faith. And so, you know, yeah, that's very, very different. Yeah. Absolutely. Methodist theology is not semi-Pelagian the way like provisionism might be. Uh, Methodist theology has basically an identical view as Calvinist theology does on the sacraments, for example. So that's why I, I kind of like it, to be honest. And another thing that I think is very inspiring, it's been inspiring to me, is how many military analogies Methodism traditionally uses. Because their whole point is the Christian faith needs to be alive and active. You can't just have a passive faith. So it's like, yeah, you're saved by faith. But that faith needs to be alive and active or the flames will die out. That's why right. all the Methodist logos have fire in them, because fire represents the Holy Spirit. You know, the um, like, I don't know, rejoice the Lord is king. That's a Methodist hymn uh, written by Charles Wesley. Beautiful hymn, amazing hymn. Um, so I really, really like the Methodist tradition, by the way. I don't like how it's been hijacked, but I also want to help restore it. So the next one I would say is the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church USA which is my denomination. It's not the only Presbyterian church. Um, there's a bunch of different denominations that have split from the mainline Presbyterian church over various years. So like the first one was the OPC, which is like hyper conservative. Then there's the the PCA, which is mainstream conservative. And there's hyper conservative. Can, real quick. Can you define, uh, the OPC is hyper conservative. I didn't, so I, I don't know, uh, I'm a bit of a hyper conservative myself, Richard. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you aware of that. So, what, what is a hyper conservative? Well, when I say hyper, now I would, in some ways, I am a hyper conservative as well. Um, but because I'm, I've been immersed in a liberal culture. Like, I, you have to make a distinction between PCA conservative and OPC conservative. I think we can all agree OPC is more conservative than the PCA. Yeah. Like, I even if they're even though even if PCA is not as conservative on some issues as we'd like, right. um, anyone in our culture who is opposed to abortion and gay marriage is conservative, right? Um, objectively so. So when I say hyper conservative, I'm not saying, oh, they're too conservative for me. Gotcha. I'm just gotcha. saying they are more conservative than the PCA is. Great. A um, at the end of this, I'll, uh, I'll let you keep going. Sorry to interrupt. But at the end of this, I do want to hear, I think our listeners would be curious, at least the ones that, that know you, uh, just to hear you know a little bit of your your own theology and where, and where you, you know, hang your coat, but go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, yeah, there's a <laughs> lot of offshoot Presbyterian denominations, but the only mainstream one, the only one that really has the institutional continuity with, uh, you know, John Knox and the reformation and all these, um, you know, traditional seminaries like Princeton, uh, Princeton theological seminary, all those is the PCUSA. Now there are some, institutions in some of these other denominations but the one of the greatest institutional strength is still the PCUSA. The PCUSA has way more resources, way more, you know, historic church buildings. I know that's not everything. Um so unlike with the Episcopal Church, I I think Presbyterianism could still survive without the PCUSA, but still the PCUSA contains so much Presbyterian heritage that generations of faithful Christian men have donated their entire lives to. 
and you know it's it's the only denomination i've ever been a part of i don't really see a good reason to leave so yes the pc usa has tons of liberalism in it i think in the pc usa the way the numbers would work is 40 percent is progressive meaning you know pride flags yeah pastors who don't believe god is real all that stuff 50% is basically moderate, lukewarm, boomer congregations. Uh, that's sort of what my church would fall into. So it's like um, in those congregations, there are you could be a liberal and be fine. You could be a conservative and be fine. And the pastor is careful to not say anything that would offend liberals or conservatives. And then 10% would be solid conservative congregations. There's I have a whole map listing where these solid conservative congregations are. There's an alliance of conservative congregations in the PCUSA. And of course... Yes, it's not as conservative as maybe we would like, but they still take a strong stand against gay marriage, strong stand against abortion. And if you listen to some of them, like Bruce Gore, Bruce Gore teaches at First Presbyterian Church in Spokane. If you listen to him, it sounds like you're listening to Doug Wilson, basically. He's strongly, you know, post-millennial. He talks a ton about how America's not just a Christian nation, but a Calvinist nation. Um it sounds like you're listening to one of these Christian nationalist dudes, except he's a teacher in the PC USA. Uh, so in many ways, the conservative end of the PC USA is indistinguishable from the PCA or the CREC, except I would say a lot more high church, a lot more institutional and all that stuff. So I see these two different groups of people like the Christian nationalist Doug Wilson crowd on one side and the conservatives in the PC USA on the other side saying basically the exact same things but unaware of each other's existence if you go to one of any no one in the pc usa has any idea that the crec exists i'm probably the only person in the pc usa who knows that it exists <laughs> and um, most people outside the pc usa think it's all super liberal they don't know that there is this strong conservative faction within it so now what is presbyterian theology for those who don't know i honestly don't think the pca our OPC, especially the PC, I don't think they've done a very good job representing what Presbyterian theology is, even though they've done a way better job than PC USA has. Uh, but traditionally, even though the PC USA, on average, is a lot more liberal than these offshoots, it's also a lot more traditional on average. Uh, because I hate the stereotype that Protestantism is not beautiful, is not traditional. Almost any PC USA church is a beautiful stained glass stone castle looking building with a beautiful choir. Everyone's wearing robes and all that. And it's not even high church. It's what low church used to look like before modernism struck. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, just because it looks like that doesn't mean it has good theology. But the people who built these churches, they had great theology. They had solid reform theology. Those institutions were just hijacked by people who deny the beliefs that those churches were founded on. A great example is if, I don't know, if you go to Covenant Presbyterian or no Church of the Covenant in Cleveland, of course, there's, you know, it's a gay affirming church where, you know, Case Western College students will just go to hang out and study like it's, I don't know, some meditation room or something. But still carved into the stone and stained glass, you can see Bible verses everywhere. You can see the reformers. You can see so many great God glorifying things. So the, the ghosts, the ghosts of good theology are still present in the PC USA. Um, and you see this tension between um, the way it was built and the people running it now. It's, it's an allied battleship that's been hijacked by pirates. Mm -hmm. And Presbyterian theology, uh, its beliefs are summarized in the Westminster Confession, but not just the Westminster Confession, also the Scots Confession. Uh, the PC USA doesn't just use Westminster, also uses the Scots Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. I like the Scots better because it has a very high view of the sacraments. Mm. Um, not that Westminster doesn't, just Scots articulates it a lot more clearly. We also use some more modern confessions like the uh, Declaration of Barman and the Confession of 1967, which, by the way, is the only confession that explicitly condemns like the sexual revolution. Mm. You would think, it, which denomination has a confession that condemns, condemns the sexual revolution, PCUSA or PCA? You'd think it's PCA, but it's actually PCUSA. <laughs> And the um, canons so, of Dort, right? Uh, not the canons of Dort, actually, but it's unnecessary because the contents of canons of Dort are already present in, in Westminster. Westminster, yeah. We also have the second Helvetic Confession, okay. um, which, funny enough, confesses the perpetual virginity of Mary, but most PCUSA pastors don't even know that. Uh, that that's an interesting detail. I'm not sure what I think about that yet. But, um, yeah, so the PCUSA, 
a lot less conservative, a lot more traditional. And I think if we want to revive traditional Reformed theology, we need to revive the PCUSA. Um, the fourth one would be the American Baptist Churches USA. Um, now, the there is the Southern Baptist Church and the American Baptist Church, was, which is kind of the Northern Baptist Church. They split over the Civil War. Now, because the Southern Baptist Church exists, I don't think it's all that necessary for right. the survival of Baptist Christianity to revive the American Baptist Church. But the American Baptist Church will be by far the easiest to revive because it's been the least hijacked out of all the mainline denominations. There are progressive American Baptist congregations. There are, you know, pride flag, BLM congregations, but they're a much smaller percentage compared to all the other mainline denominations. So out of all of them, the American Baptist Church has been the least hijacked. And, you know, there is a strong Northern Baptist tradition, and I think it's a lot more high church than the Southern Baptist Church you'll always see this dichotomy in Protestantism. Generally, the more high church a Protestant group is, the more progressive it's been, and the more low church it is, the more the more conservative it has remained. I don't know why that is. I, I think it's personally because leftists hijack whatever is more institutionally powerful. Uh, but the American Baptist and Church beautiful. a lot of great I think I yeah. think leftists, you know, a part of it, like I think leftists know they're going to hell, and so they, you know, they want to grab a little piece of heaven while they're here on earth, you know, so whether it's living on the coast, I mean, from geography to institutions, to churches at every level, I think um, it's an infatuation with beauty. You know, I I think it's it's like, this is as close as we can get. We can't create beauty ourselves. All we can do is take it from somebody else. So I I think that there's a natural, like a moth, you know, attracted to the flame uh, when it comes to leftists. Cause, cause leftism uh, leftism is ugly. Like, I mean, that's the default mechanism is, you know, it takes a dude and, and, you know, puts lipstick on him and makes him an ugly chick, you know? So, so they, I think they're attracted to beauty. And I've seen so many of my, you know, young women that I know, um, female friends I've had make themselves more ugly intentionally as they be became leftist. Oh yeah. As Calvin Robinson said, when someone becomes trans, they try to make themselves look less human and you can see that. Um, so yeah, the Northern Baptist heritage, there's Rhode Island, there's Brown University. It's like um, there's a stereotype that, you know, Baptists um, don't value education. Well, if we revive Brown University, revive the American Baptist Church, uh, we could reverse that stereotype. Well, let, let me ask of... you a question real quick. So I, you know, I'm a Baptist for better or worse. I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily mm-hmm. proud of it, but I am um, barely, uh, you know, credo Baptist. Uh, but a lot of times when people think of Presbyterians and they think of Baptists, those are, you know, probably the groups that I interact with the most. You know, a lot of my friends are like, I was Baptist, but now I'm Presbyterian. And, you know, I always correct mm-hmm. them and say, no, you're not. Um, you're, you're a pedo Baptist. You're, you're more, more so like a congregationalist in, in the frame of, you know, like a John Owen, uh, because here's the key word. People miss this. Uh, when it comes to Presbyterianism, the key word, and, and you, you tell me if you think I'm wrong here, Richard, but key word for Presbyterianism, I think would be presbytery. Um, that it actually had something to do with the polity. It's not just your mode of baptism. Um, it, you know, if you're Presbyterian, you're you're not. You know, Baptists are notorious for, in terms of our polity. We, you know, we would hold to the autonomy of the local church. Whereas Presbyterians are actually a part of a presbytery. It's not just local church autonomy. And so, all that being said, my point is with you know wh- whether it's Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist or um, North American Baptist. My my, my thought is. Uh, you know, you said it's one of the least hijacked. Well, to me, that mm-hmm. makes sense practi- for a number of reasons. One, because it probably is more low church and, and therefore less desirable. Uh, but then number two, it's hard to hijack Baptist um, because you you have to go individually, local church by local church by local church, because all the local churches typically own their own properties, their own buildings. Uh, they're autonomous in terms of their polity. They're not a part of a presbytery or, you know, there, there's no Episcopalian hierarchy of, you know, church polity or um, they're, they're, each one is independent and autonomous. So it's hard to hijack, uh, but it's also hard to win back. Uh, like, you, I mean, you would have to win it back organically and individually by simply, you know, taking based, you know, conservative ministers and putting them in each individual pulpit. Uh, That's the only, you know, that's the only thing that you can do with Baptists. And so there's, I think there's a great strength there, but I also am, you know, I'm, I'm not disillusioned. I recognize that there's a massive weakness to Baptist polity. Um, You know, so anyway, so how how do you, I guess my question is, um, I, the Baptists, I think, are more resilient uh, because if you mm-hmm. take over, if it's Presbyterian or Episcopalian or Anglican, um, you can you can take the whole thing. 
Uh, with Baptist, you can never take the whole thing, um, but you also, you know, that works. That's that's a two way street. It works both ways. You can't you can't take the whole thing, um, you know, in a progressive sense. But but you also you can't just say, hey, we're going to take back this whole uh, Baptist denomination. And it's like, well, no, you you're you're stuck fighting each individual church battle. Yeah, I know it's a trade off either way. I was wondering why the American Baptist Church was the least hijacked, and I was wondering if it was congregationalism. But then I remember the most hijacked denomination is also Congregationalist, What's the that? United Church of Christ. Oh, they okay. are the descendants of the Puritans. They're by far the most liberal, most hijacked. And the same is true in other countries. I think the most liberal denomination in the world is the United Church of Canada, whereas cons conservative churches in the United Church of Canada, also Congregationalist, are like progressive churches in the Episcopal Church. It's absolutely hmm. insane. It's like in the United Church of Canada, if you are a theist, that makes you in the conservative faction. <laughs> and um, and uh, also in also in England, the most conservative, e even though the Church of England is getting hijacked, it's not nearly as liberal as the United Reformed Church in England, which is Congregationalist. So, and when you say Congregationalist, just you are saying um, that these are local autonomous churches. That there's no yes. there's no hierarchy outside of the local church. Yeah, and because of that, even in the UCC, even though the UCC is overall the most liberal, there are a few conservative UCC churches and the denomination as a whole can't do anything about it. So there's like, yeah, we're conservative, deal with it. Um, so that is pretty cool. And I, I like how in congregationalism, like you said, harder to hijack, also harder to take back. Yeah. Um, so the reason I would say, I guess I would say the reason that the UCC got hijacked despite being congregationalist is probably because the seminaries got hijacked. So they just began gotcha. churning out progressive pastors, whereas I don't think many of the Baptist seminaries got hijacked nearly as badly. That's um, insightful. I, no, I think you're right about that. I think that that's, that's the way you do it. If it's a congregational polity and each individual church is autonomous, then the way that you take an entire denomination is you just have to be the guy who gets to decide uh, how to train up the entire next generation of, of ministers. You know, if mm -hmm. you can, if you can hijack the seminary and start teaching, you know, like and you think of like the conservative resurgence that happened with, you know, Southern Seminary back in the day mm -hmm. with Moeller, you know, it was like I, there were professors on the first day, you know, taking the Bible, throwing it in the trash can in front of their students and saying that uh, Jesus was the bastard son of a whore, you know, and then Moeller got in there and fired them all. And, you know, a bunch of people graduated, wouldn't even shake his hand on the platform, you know, and that's, and that's, that's very the, inspiring. That's very inspiring. Yeah. If the Baptists could go from throwing the Bible in the trash to being the most conservative mainline denomination there is. From what um, I know, that, it, you, you obviously are more, um, are, are more informed on mainline, you know, denominations. And I'm not saying Southern Baptist uh, f even fits that category, but if we're talking about just sheer size, take history, um, out out of the equation, but if we're just talking about sheer size, uh, it from what I know, it's a fact that's indisputable that uh, Southern Baptists are they're the only mainline Protestant denomination um, of even close to that size that went full full left in the seminaries and then came all the way back. Um, and well, from yeah, I I think the SBC honestly is a a successful example of Reconquista working of yep. a mainline denomination that got retaken. The SBC and the LCMS are both examples of denominations that are technically mainline, historically speaking. Right. The only reason they're not in the list of mainline denominations is because they're not liberal anymore. LCMS also had a reconquista, sort of, not as severe as SBC, but there was the whole Seminex controversy. Have you heard about that? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, in one of the LCMS seminaries, I think it was Concordia Seminary, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of their seminaries was teaching liberal theology. Um, and then some conservatives swooped in and fixed it. And then there was a huge walkout of students. And because they're progressives, right. because they're brats, they just smashed everything, stole stuff from the library. <laughs> they, they, they threw a huge hissy fit temper tantrum. They ended up splitting off and forming something that eventually merged to join the ELCA. So LCMS and SBC are examples of how even if a denomination is hijacked, it could be unhijacked. Yeah. Um, so respect to the Baptists, it's like, you know, some people think I'm anti-Baptist just because of how much of a stickler I am for, you know, traditional liturgy and sacramentology. But honestly, the Baptists have done the best to combat liberalism within their ranks. I think you could say, yeah. as a Pato Baptist, I think you could 
somewhat credit credo baptism for that because it is does somewhat prevent you know unbelievers from having too high a, a a role in the church. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's the polity. So I think it's the congregationalism, the local autonomy. And then, yeah, I think that, you know, for better or worse, regardless of where you land theologically on that issue, I think that um, regenerate church membership as a conviction is, you know, it's just, it's going to naturally police its borders, um, you know, at least, mm -hmm. at least more. You know, there's, there's no perfect policing. I, you know, I'm a credo Baptist minister and I yeah. baptized, you know, plenty of unregenerate people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, at the oh, end yeah. of the day, it's funny, you know, like, but, you know, people are like, I'm not, I'm not going to baptize a baby. And, you know, and then they give their, their reasoning, you know, some of my Baptist friends is like, cause I'm not going to baptize someone who's unregenerate. And I'm like, well, then you just need to stop baptizing, you know, because, <laughs> uh, you know, cause I can just, I can look at families in the church and if it's a longstanding, you know, Christian family in the church, that has been there for a decade, um, you know, and they've got five kids. I, I know that, uh, statistically speaking, uh, my chances, you know, if I was to baptize those five children in infancy um, that are coming from good stock, for lack of a better term, they're coming from good, solid Christian parents, uh, I've got, you know, a, a higher chance of all five of them turning out to be regenerate than, uh, yeah. than baptizing five adults um, who have, you know, a, a conversion testimony, uh, but weren't raised in the church and are coming in, you know, to, to faith in their 20s or 30s. Um, in, in the final analysis, statistically speaking, you know, t if you you know, just, just turn the clock forward 10 years. Um, there's a good chance that there's going to, I'm going to have a higher percentage of apostasy for, you know, the five adults that I baptized without a oh, Christian, sure. you know, upbringing than the, the five infants that were raised in the church by Christian parents. So, um, yeah, anyways, that, that sounds yeah. like a very classical Calvinist view of, you know, what election even is. Cause you know, Calvin said, we can't really know who is elect or not. We can only trust in, you know, uh, faithfulness over a long period of time. Right. Um, right. right. So, well, I and, and I'm one of the rare Baptists that I actually, I do, you know, you might find this funny and say, no, you don't, you know, and that's fine. You can disagree with me. I, in fact, I welcome your pushback. It'd be a fun conversation, but I, you know, I do prescribe to covenant succession, even as a um, credo Baptist and uh, yeah. And then with the sacraments, when it comes to the Lord's supper, like I'm not a memorialist or a mere memorialist. Um, I, I believe in Christ's spiritual presence um, being uniquely there with, um, with the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Um, so, you know, we yeah. we're, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're as high church, I guess, as you could get, you know, as a Baptist. So not saying much, yeah. but, um, but you know, more than the average Baptist. All right. Everybody's been asking, can I live stream your conference? And the answer is a resounding no, you will be there in person or you will not be there at all. I'm just kidding. You actually can live stream the conference. We're excited to announce we're making it available to anybody and everybody who wants to watch this conference right as it's happening, which is March 1st and 2nd. That's a Friday and Saturday of 2024. What conference am I even talking about? It's called Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. We've got Pastor Douglas Wilson. We've got Dr. Joe Boot. We've got Brian Sauvey. We've got Eric Kahn. And then, of course, yours truly, Joel Webbin. We've got seven primary sessions in the conference, each one being probably 50 to 60 minute long uh, sessions, lectures, sermons, whatever you want to call them, and then two live panels, each being an hour and a half long. Now, one of the panels is on biblical patriarchy. We're going to have uh, Pastor Douglas Wilson available for that panel, and we decided to get Eric Kahn, because Eric Kahn, biblical patriarchy, let's just be honest, it's a sensitive topic, but Eric Khan, I think, is known as one of the most nuanced, careful, and sensitive individuals, especially on the Twitter streets. So we're going to have him as a part of that panel. It'll go really well. Then the second panel is Haunted Cosmos live show. You've got Brian Sauvey and Ben Garrett talking about the most unhinged things imaginable, hopefully some things that are actually truthful. Now, th th there will be some truthful things. They're going to stick to scripture, and when they speculate, and you know they will, they'll at least let you know that it's speculation, and they won't pass it off as though it's in the infallible word of God. So live stream this conference. How do you do it? Go to patreon.com forward slash right response ministries. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash right response ministries. A lot of guys charge 50 bucks, 60 bucks, 80 bucks. We are asking that you would simply partner with us for $10 a month. And let's be real. You could do it one month, live stream all the content and then cancel your subscription and if you do no harm no foul if you want to stick with us and support this ministry what god's doing through right response then praise god that's great and we thank you either way technically it's only 10 bucks go over the last denomination yeah go quick. for it
and it's the RCA, the Reformed Church in America. This has also not been very hijacked. I'm familiar the with Reform- them. Yeah, the RCA received the Reconquista movement the best. So um, this is not in my list because it's a very liberal denomination that I don't have the highest hopes for. When So what we did on Reformation Day, this past Reformation Day, all the factions of the Reconquista movement, the Reconquista members in every seven mainline denomination wrote 95 theses against liberalism tailored to their own denomination and emailed them to every mainline church. I mean, every mainline church in the country, you know, that had an email. And we also physically posted copies of our 95 theses on the doors of hundreds of mainline churches across the country. Uh, there's thousands of young young people and some pastors as well involved in the Reconquista movement. And different denominations received the 95 theses differently. The ELCA, the bishops all sent out emails saying, oh, these are a group of, you know, Nazi terrorists, whatever, um, all sorts of, you know, silly left-wing uh, screeching accusations uh, that made no sense at all. But the RCA received the 95 theses very well. They were like, oh, thanks for sending us this. This is very interesting. We're going to discuss it at our next synod meeting. And members of the RCA Reconquista, they've started an organization called the Reformed Revivalists of America. They've like been invited to like RCA general conferences and stuff. So I think of all the Reconquistas so far, the RCA Reconquista has been the most successful. Generally, the Dutch Reformed denominations parallel to the Presbyterian denominations have always been a bit more doctrinally faithful. So the, um, what I mean by that is the, uh, the RCA has always been more conservative than the PCUSA on average. Uh, the, I don't know, the conservative Dutch reformed denominations have always instructed and uh, enforced confessionalism more strictly than the conservative Presbyterian denominations. Um, so I, I think the Dutch reformed are, a lot better than the Presbyterians are at maintaining doctrinal purity. The churches in the, the Protestant churches in the, in the Netherlands are, I think, a bit more conservative than the, you know, Church of Scotland, for example. So, you know, respect to my my Dutch Reformed friends for that. So the RCA, I'm very optimistic about. Um, the United Methodist Church, I'm not quite as optimistic about. The two I'm most pessimistic about are the two ones that I did not include in this list of five, the ELCA and the UCC. Luckily for the ELCA, uh, I think by God's providence, the denomination that's going to be hardest to Reconquista is also the one that is least necessary to Reconquista because we also have a parallel mainline conservative Luther, Lutheran denomination, which is the LCMS. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yes, I would love to still retake the ELCA because there's a unique Scandinavian heritage to the ELCA, whereas the LCMS is more of a German heritage, and they represent two different theological streams within Lutheranism rather than just two different ethnicities. Like LCM, the German Lutheranism is a lot more, you know, by the book mainstream confessional and Scandinavian Lutheranism is more pietistic, more, you know, think Kierkegaard, stuff like that. Mm. Interesting stuff to retake. I'm, I'm an irenic ecumenical guy, so I would like to see all sorts of different expressions of Christianity, healthy and thriving and working for, I see different denominations as provinces of the kingdom of God, which makes, um, it's like nails on a chalkboard to Eastern Orthodox people when I say that, but <laughs> you know what I mean? So those are the five denominations. So do you have any questions for me about what I believe or about the Reconquista movement as a whole? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you're Presbyterian. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that you're reformed with your soteriology. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yes. Yep. Um, so that means I get five points of Calvinism, even though those that's just a small part of what Calvinism actually is. I know it's still correct. All of it's correct. We're saved because we are because by grace alone, fundamentally, and faith and works flow out of that. Right, right. Um, men and women, your views on uh, men and women. I'm assuming that you're. I don't know. You may not like the word patriarchy. What do you think about that? Well, it's just, it's how do you define that word? Of course, um, anyone who believes that a woman should take her husband's last name, which I do, believes in some sort of patriarchy. Right. Um, patriarchy could mean anything from uh, your children should inherit the father's last name, which the majority of Americans would still probably believe. Um, it could mean anything from that to, you know, uh, women can't sneeze in public without their husband's permission. Um, so... 
when we say biblical patriarchy, I confess that that's something I have not spent much time thinking about as of now. I'm sympathetic to people. I definitely oppose the feminist movements. What should we believe instead of mainstream feminism? That's something I'm not quite decided on at this time. Yeah, I guess that's I what do- I'm asking. So if you're not a feminist, uh, if you're not egalitarian, then you no. know what, what word do you use? Like, what, what, How do you describe your views of men and women? I don't describe myself as egalitarian or complementarian, even though I am against female pastors. I call myself a gender essentialist. Uh, so my view of gender roles is they don't they shouldn't be challenged. They also don't need to be enforced. You know, in middle school, nobody tells the boys and the girls to sit on opposite sides of the auditorium. It just happens. Men and women are simply different by nature. So I think you just let those differences play out. And that's just how it, that's just how it's going to be. I don't like the terms egalitarian and complementarian to refer to the question of whether women should be pastors, because there are some complementarians like N.T. Wright who support female pastors. N.T. Wright does not like when people argue for female pastors on the basis of men and women can do the same things. His argument is men and women have different abilities, and that's why they'll serve the pastor, the pastoral office in different ways. So he's supporting female pastors from a complementarian perspective. And there's also some egalitarians who just out of obedience to tradition, think of like more liberal Catholics who don't think women should be pastors simply because it's tradition. I've heard some Catholics, they don't believe first Timothy two twelve forbids women from being pastors. They simply don't have female pastors out of obedience to tradition. Mm-hmm. So I don't think the labels egalitarian and complementarian are necessarily the most helpful for describing the debate over whether women should be pastors. I've always had a complementarian view of men and women, that they complement each other um, in, in the most abstract sense of the word. I used to support female pastors. I used to make arguments for female pastors. The whole like, oh, women were the first witnesses to the resurrection and all that. It was actually my girlfriend who tore my argument to shreds and convinced me to um, not support female pastors because she's Hmm. um, always been part of the PCA. Um, So yeah, I used to, when I first converted to Christianity, it wasn't like I immediately abandoned all my left wing views. It took two years after converting for me to realize homosexuality is wrong. It took me three years, really three years, three and a half years to realize women shouldn't be pastors. It took me, I went through a process of deconstruction, but what I deconstructed was the religion of leftism, not my Christian faith. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely, women should not be pastors because the Bible says they should not be pastors. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard some arguments for women being pastors, but I haven't heard one that does not rely on mental gymnastics. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason I think, you know, I use biblical patriarch one, because it's just, it's a very old word. Um, and I think it's a good word. I think it's a biblical word. Um, but also I use it to, you know, compare and con- contrast <clears throat> between uh, patriarchy and complementarianism. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the term complementarian um, one, because it's, you know, it, it's the term's 15 minutes old, you know, so Piper and Grudem, 1988, uh, coins, uh, the phrase. And, you know, I, I do believe that men and women are created by God, uh, as, uh, similar, but also distinct. And, you know, the similarities are enough to where, you know, the woman actually is a suitable helpmate and the distinctions are enough to where they actually complement one another. So I'm fine with the basic, you know, the, the basic premise, the concept is fine. Um, but, uh, this is what I've noticed. I think complementarianism has come to, uh, it's, it's come to just imply people, you know, it's just assumed baked into the term that, uh, that the differences between men and women are strictly physical. Um, so, you know, right. so that, you know, that there's a difference in role, distinction in role, the, uh, distinction in role stems from a distinction in design. Uh, but that distinction at the level of design, uh, doesn't go any further than uh, physical design. Uh, so, you know, women are called to nurture and, and, you know, to, um, to rear children, you know, to, um, you know, these kinds of things, because that's their physical design and men are called to, you know, work out of the home or be in positions of, uh, combat, you know, when it comes to, you know, the state and military and those kinds of things because of their physical frame um, and, uh, you know, all of it stemming from design. And uh, I think, you know, part of my problem with that is um, you read older theologians and um, and they just, they have more to say than that. It's not just men and women are called to different things because they uh, are physically different. Um, but, 
uh, older theologians, and I think more importantly, scripture, uh, talks about not just physical distinctions between men and women, but the, the distinction actually goes all the way down. Uh, so like when the apostle Paul cites the reason for um, a woman not uh, exercising authority or teaching over a man, uh, he doesn't just give the order of creation, uh, but he actually cites the order of the fall. Uh, it was not man who was deceived and became a sinner, but the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Uh, you yeah. read, you know, any older theologian, especially before the 1960s, and they're just going to say it as though it's a matter of fact, that, you know, that like with very little explanation, because in their mind, it didn't need to be explained. It was just a universal truth that women are more susceptible to uh, being deceived than men. So not just a physical difference, but there's a psychological, if you want to call it that, or mental or spiritual or emotional, uh, but it's beyond just the physical distinction. There are other distinctions as well, rooted in, in the design, uh, in, in the makeup of men and women, that is not only a physical distinction, but an emotional, spiritual distinction, and that that too plays into differing uh, roles, so that a man is going to be more resilient in a teaching role and in a leadership role uh, than a wife who's going to be uh, a woman, you know, who's going to be more susceptible to, well, let me hear you out. And what, what, what is your argument? And uh, let me sympathize with you. And that works really great with motherhood. You know, I always think of like Kentonji uh, Brown Jackson, you know, when she, you know, when she was on the chopping block, you know, for Supreme Court justice. And one of the, you know, the big um, uh, objections was that she had been soft on um, uh, men who had, uh, harbored, you know, child pornography uh, and pedophilia. And, uh, you know, and her, her kind of, her mindset is, you know, what it seemed to be uh, compassion. It's like, well, this, this poor young man, you know, he probably didn't have a good mom. And that's great if she wants to be a mom, you know, but if she wants to be a Supreme Court justice, uh, you know, a man's perspective is you did what uh, with kids? Okay, let's get a rope and find a tree and, uh, and let's, you know, take care. Ace. You know, yeah. like it's very, you know, men are very, you know, we're just different. And so, but my point is n that difference that I just described with Kentonji, you know, Brown Jackson, none of that is, uh, has to do with how much you can bench press or, you know, hip radius. That's, that's not uh, a mere, you know, physical distinction. That's, that is a, uh, that's a, an emotional or mental or psychological or spiritual distinction. So when I say patriarchal, um, all I mean is father rule. We live in the father's world and the father has chosen to, um, to, uh, uh, disseminate his blessings to his uh, image-bearing creatures through fathers, familial fathers, ecclesiastical fathers, civil fathers. Um, so we live in the father's world and he blesses his, uh, his, his image-bearing creatures through fathers. That's what I mean by patriarchy. But beyond that, the reason why I use patriarchy instead of complementarian is because in my experience, anytime I'm talking to somebody who's complementarian, uh, they believe that men and women in, in, the, in the area, the realm of role, that the, their roles complement one another because they're distinct, but uh, the distinction of roles is, uh, is exclusively stemming from a distinction in physical design, uh, but not emotional or mental or anything else. And I think patriarchy, I'm saying, no, there's a physical difference, but there are other differences as well. And just one, just all I have to do to prove the argument is, is one. And I think biblically I can cite, you know, the example of, but woman was, uh, you know, deceived and became um, a sinner. And I think the Apostle Paul, I don't think it's arbitrary or random. I think he's citing the order, not just of creation, but the order of the fall for the for his reasoning for why a woman should not teach um, a man, because a woman was uh, not just because she has hips and breasts, uh, but because she was deceived. So. Exactly. I um, Even when I supported female pastors, I recognize that the Bible teaches women are more easily deceived. I also experienced that in my own personal life because this transgender movement, it's a social contagion. Homosexuality is a contagious disease, just like, you know, the flu. Um, and it's often social contagions happen a lot more rapidly among groups of girls than among groups of guys. I think depression yes. is also a contagious disease um, that circulates among girls. There's a big link between depression and homosexuality. I think my most radically right wing view is my views of psychology and mental health that um a lot of what psychologists say is, is total bs but yeah uh, i've seen you. is i even when i try to mental gymnastics my way into supporting female pastors i recognize the reality that m women are more easily deceived than men what i also believe and i th still think this is true in some sense is women because ideas are more contagious among women women think in groups women are like sort of dogs they act and think in groups men are like cats they act and think more independently um so in some sense women are also more susceptible to the gospel um because 
they I think they might have less individualistic pride. We see that um, Mary, the mother of God, was a lot more willing to accept God's commands for her, um, a lot more than a lot of the male heroes throughout the Old Testament are. It's like God tells a man to do something, like God tells Jonah, like, hey, preach to these people. Jonah's like, no, I hate them. I don't want to. And then God tells Mary through the angel that you're you're literally going to give birth to God. And she's like, okay, sure. Um, so I think there's a, of course, there's a good side to um, women being more easily persuaded, more... Um, yeah, it's not. More. Yeah, it, it, it. Just to clarify, it's nothing. In my assessment, it's nothing but positive. There, there's only the positive side. The, the only thing that makes it negative is um, because it's God's design, I, and I think it's purposeful. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's just a result of the fall. So I, I don't think that in a prelapsarian world um, that you know that Eve would have been um, uh, theologically and mentally and emotionally just as uh, just as resilient as Adam. I think they still would have been different. Right. That Eve would have had just a more a, a by, by nature, just a, a more natural, accepting, following, submissive disposition than, than her husband. I think that's actually, that's not just a, a part of the curse, but that's a part of uh, the design before sin ever entered the world. So I think it's, it's entirely positive. It only becomes negative uh, when you take someone who has um, a different design and then you put them in a male role. That's, that's what makes it bad. Um, but if a woman is yeah. in, um, in a womanly, domestic, nurturing role that God intends for her, then all those things are net positives. They're all strengths. None of them are weaknesses. Uh, you, right. In fact, they're, uh, they're vital. Uh, without, without that component in the home, uh, then the home is it's cold, it's stale, it's, uh, it's, it's not a place where children want to be. Um, so we, yeah. we need yeah. women to be women, and we need men to be men. Uh, but it also makes sense in terms of household conversions. You know, when I think about that, you know, back to like the, the example I was giving earlier, you know, of five children, you know, coming from good stock, you know, they're, you know, they're the uh, fourth generation of Christ, a Christian family, you know, where there's been no apostasies, you know, and, and their parents have loved the Lord and grandparents have loved the Lord. Like, I, I think, you know, the same kind of thing. Um, if the husband, you look at statistics, I, I forget yes, exactly father. what it is. You're probably aware, but if if uh, if yeah. a man comes to Christ, the likelihood of his children, um, you know, uh, ending up fo being followers of Christ when they're older, I think it's like seventy something, high seventies, like 77, 78 percent chance. Uh, whereas if the man is not a believer and does not attend church, uh, but but the wife, the mother does, uh, that the children, I think it's it's like uh, eleven percent or twelve percent, like it's. It's uh, yeah, my, very my family is an example of that. My dad was the first to commit to Christ fully in my family. Um, in my family, I was the last one to become Christian, but the first one to become conservative because even after both my parents became Christian, it took them a much longer time than it took me to deconstruct the leftism they were, you know, grew up around and stuff. But yeah, my father was the first one in our family to become a Christian. Um, he got baptized in a PCA church in 2012, I believe, converted from Judaism. It's really hard to convert from Judaism because there's so much, you know, you're, you're ostracized by the Jewish community if you do so. Uh, so yeah, I really, uh, that was, that was inspirational to me. Yeah. That's, uh, that's and, amazing. Yeah. That's impressive. Good for him. Yeah. And most families, uh, and now he's an elder at our PC USA church and he prevented a pride flag from going up last June. He shot down that proposal by one of the Great. liberal, liberal congregants in our, um, so so yeah, he's uh, definitely at a strong conversion. And I just, I see in general, most of the time when like uh, children fall away from the faith, they often have like a religious mother, but not a religious father. Yes. And I know this is fictional, but you know, if, I'm not sure if you've ever watched Young Sheldon. Um, uh, I, I'm familiar with it. I haven't watched, but yeah. yeah. So it's like the uh, the mom is really the only one in the family who's hard, a hardcore Christian. And the dad just sort of goes along with it. A lot of U.S. presidents only went to church because their wives dragged them. I think overall, um, women are generally more religious than men because just the way, you know, false teaching spreads among women, true teaching also spreads among women. Um, but in a family, I think you really need a religious father if you're going to have any safe bet that the children are going to stay religious into their uh, adulthood. There's yep. many examples where the mom or the grandma cares a lot about the faith, uh, but the children do not. And then that's a recipe for disaster. So. All, I told all the ladies out there, whatever you do, stay far away from a guy who is not committed to going to church on his own. It doesn't matter if he'll go along with you to make you happy. If he's not committed to going to church on his own, stay away from him. No yep. missionary dating. Amen. No missionary dating. Um, 
Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, yeah, it's it's funny thinking about feminism. Did you ever read, there's a book, I forget the author's name, but he's he's Roman Catholic. Uh, it's called Impotent Church, and it just uh, traces, no. what? I have not read it, no. It, it just traces feminism uh, throughout church history, pr- predominantly through, through uh, Roman Catholic history. Uh, but it was just interesting because I always, you know, I think I just assumed that feminism was a much more modern development um, and that it hadn't been in the church that long. Um, but it was just tracing back and, you know, talking about, you know, um, the, you know, the priesthood and, you know, the, the fact that, you know, Catholic priests couldn't be married and the appeal for women if they really wanted to serve the Lord was to, you know, to forego, um, you know, uh, being a wife and being a mother and instead to be uh, a nun, you know, and so then there was, you know, so much of uh, the Catholic um, infatuation with uh, Mary was because of uh, nuns not being able to marry. Uh, and, and so uh, because they were single, perpetually single, um, they would associate, uh, they, because they still longed, had this innate longing for motherhood, they would associate with Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. So when they thought of Jesus, it's kind of like a Ricky Bobby situation, Will Ferrell, you know, like, well, I like to think of the eight pound, six ounce, you know, baby Jesus, you know. So when Catholic nuns were thinking about Jesus, they naturally would think about Jesus as a baby because they so badly wanted to be mothers, but weren't allowed to. And so they would actually have dolls. Like uh, it was common to find uh, cribs in the nuns' rooms. They would make cribs and then they would have like, uh, you know, corn husk uh, dolls, baby baby dolls of baby Jesus. And they would be nursing, you know, pretending. So in their in their uh, devotions and quiet time and praying the rosary, they would be pretending to nurse this baby doll of of Jesus, you know? And, and so, so much of uh, Catholic, um, ethos was surrounding this motherly, nurturing, feminine, you know, kind of thing. And this is like, this is like back with like Anselm, you know, like, uh, I mean, this is a thousand years old, you know, feminism alive and well in the Catholic church. And, and wouldn't you know, it all comes down to forbidding marriage. So. Yeah. Now something I'd like to point out, and this might make me feminist according to some people on Twitter, um, women can, and have had a lot of good influence in the church but it's often through their husbands. Like a lot of, um, I read this, I saw this Mormon book title that basically said, um, thanks to these three queens, they defined what Christians would believe for the rest of the centuries. And it was just basic Nicene orthodoxy. So women have had lots of influence in the church. It was often, you know, through their, through their husbands under the leadership of their husbands, because, you know, women are supposed to help men, not just help men do the dishes or whatever, but help men in, in all sorts of ways. And there have been like, there, feminists tell this narrative that before the feminist movement, women never had any influence other than just, you know, domestic chores and, and raising children and stuff. Well, first of all, raising children in itself is a massive influence right. because everyone um, gets their ideas and beliefs from their mother. I think it's very important for women to have good theology because Right. Children often um, the first teacher of every child is their mother, so that's why um, women need good theology. But also, it's like in the Middle Ages there was Hildegard von Bingen, the most the most important medieval uh, Christian composer. So it's feminists tell this narrative that it was absolute hell for women before feminism came along. Every statistic shows that feminism has made women way more miserable and has way made more. a culture that's a lot less safe for women. And has yep. done nothing to decrease the abuse of women. It's just um, caused women to be abused by um, their boyfriends as opposed to their husbands. It yep. has done absolutely nothing to change any of that. Yep. Cool. Well, redeemed Zoomer. Um, thank you, Richard. This was great. Yeah, it was good to get to know you a little bit. I've seen you, you know, on, on Twitter a little bit, and uh, and I, I I watched a couple of your videos. You know, I watched some of it, and uh, I, I I didn't know what to expect, but I you know I watched and. Um, and then just saw you building cathedrals on Minecraft. And I was like, this is, uh, this is a big moment for me where, uh, for the first time in my life, I realize I'm old. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was like, what is this? Well. Building cathedrals on a video game and talking about, you know, denominations. And it's so yeah. interesting. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me on. This is great. You're welcome. God bless.